Good day, dear ladies and gentlemen. Uh, everybody, especially boys, uh, in the childhood like to play different kind of machines, and some of them even dream to uh, construct something new of them. But our guest, I think, has never expected since childhood to construct not simple machines, but molecular machines. So a very warm welcome to Jean-Pierre Savage, 2016 Nobel Laureate in Chemistry. Jean-Pierre, it's a great pleasure. It's great to have you on a discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. And the first thing I would like to learn is the way in the scientific activities to the to being a Nobel Laureate. So your colleague, uh, Bernard Feringa, in 1999, has created first rotary molecular engines. Uh, rotary how, motor, yes. Yeah, oh, sorry. And how long did it take for each group of scientists, uh, <laughs> including your other colleague, uh, Fraser Stoddard, uh, eventually to become Nobel laureate? Yeah, it's a very good question, you know. But um, you have to realize that um, you do not say to yourself one day, I want to win a Nobel Prize and I will do this and this and this to be very successful and finally to be awarded a Nobel Prize. You cannot reason this way, you know. You do your research, uh, you are excited by some topic, you do some work in a given topic. At some stage, you may want to do something else. You jump from a given field to another field. Uh, and after maybe a couple of years, you reorient your research. So it's not a linear approach. You know, you are not on a, on a straight uh, road, you know, uh, mm -hmm. looking at the end, you know, looking at the infinite. Um, it's much more chaotic, you know, for all the people I know. So uh, at some stage, you decide that you will try and make molecular machines. But you have already a big background, you know. You have a scientific past behind you, which helped you make molecular machines. So you have to calculate overall. I mean, it took a lot of years, you know, a lot of time, many years. Uh, but these many years were not completely devoted to molecular machines and molecular motors. They were devoted to many, many other topics, uh, many other research areas. All right. So, and personally, you, how do you think what is the most interesting and the most significant work do you have? I mean, as you said, uh, you have a very wide range of studies. So what is the most you think significant and important? Yeah. Uh, the most significant. Um, so we have been, um, maybe I, I can explain you, you know, what uh, I have been doing and what we have been doing, uh, my co-workers and me. Um, we have been working in several fields. Uh, one which was very important was water splitting, trying to split the water molecule to H2 and O2 okay. using light energy, and in particular using solar energy. It's a very important project. You know, many people have been working on this project for many years. Uh, it's, uh, of course, it's a beautiful reaction if you can succeed uh, because it would uh, afford dihydrogen uh, from water and from solar light. So that would be fantastic because dihydrogen, as I'm sure you know, is the ideal fuel. When you burn dihydrogen, you generate water and that's all. Yeah. And so that was a big, big project. And from this project, um, more or less by accident, uh, we made catenanes. Catenanes are interlocking rings. You know, I'll just show you the, the simplest catenane. It's yeah. a two catenane consisting 
of two rings, interlocking rings. Okay. And having done that, we realized that we could try to set the molecules in motion. And so from cations, we moved on towards molecular machines and molecular motors. And we started to make a rotary motor, a catenane for which one ring will glide within the other ring. We partly succeeded, but we had no control over directionality. It was kind of a pirouetting machine. You know, the ring was going one direction or the opposite direction, uh, not really rotating, but we said pirouetting, uh, oscillating. And that was in 94. And after that, you know, I think it was exactly at the same time as the very first uh, paper published by the group of Fraser Stoddart. Uh, it was the beginning of the molecular machine field. And as you said, in 99, Fraser, uh, Ben Feringa published a fantastic piece of work with his group uh, on a rotary motor. And then it, it developed, you know, it, it grew up uh, and we have been interested in many various uh, molecular machines since the 1994 initial work. Okay, that's amazing. Yeah, thanks. Uh, the application of your discovery uh, in molecular medicine, in particular targeted drug delivery uh, using molecular machines, do you think the development uh, of such technologies and methods can uh, save us from surgery, from radio or hemotherapies in the fight against cancer? You've talked yeah, about that. Yeah, it's a very good point. I think, you know, you exactly, you, you know, you speak about the, probably the most exciting potential application of molecular machines, uh, which will be to make biocompatible molecular machines which is not the case today, you know. The molecular machines, the many molecular machines which have been made by chemists, not only by Stoddard, Feringa, and my group, but by nowadays many groups uh, are not biocompatible. You know, they would be toxic. They would not be accepted by a living organism. Uh, and so I think it's a big project for the future to mix you know, uh, biocompatibility and molecular machines and motors, and then to see their effect you know, when you inject them in a, in a body um, to see whether they can, uh, in fact, as you say, navigate, find uh, targets to be destroyed like uh, malignant cells, cancer cells, or viruses or bacteria. It's probably one of the big, big projects. But I'm afraid it will take time. You know, we are still um, relatively far away from uh, using those molecular machines in, in medicine. Okay. We'll hope that it will be as soon as possible in any case. Okay. In the future. Okay. And the point is that pharma industry should be interested in that as well. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Uh, you believe in genetics. Yeah, the, sure. Okay, and uh, there are ancient books which could possess some probably dubious kind of information, but in any case, uh, there is information that people previously lived up to thousand years, and more precisely, the example of uh, the person which, who is called uh, Methuselin, uh, who probably lived like 969 years of life. Uh, do you think our genes have degraded from the time possibly uh, to the life expectancy of the indicators that we have now? How do you think? I do not believe that anyone on earth has lived for more than a century. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm not a believer. But you believe in into the genetics, how do you think could it be possible to extend the life expectancy in future as well? 
not so like the, for centuries, but at least probably like 200 years, maybe. Um, I don't know. I mean, uh, my knowledge of genetics is not uh, good enough for me to have an opinion. I'm not sure it would be desirable. All right. you know, maybe you will find it shocking, but I don't think it would be a good thing, you know, if we could increase the, the lifespan of uh, human beings uh, up to two centuries, 200 years. Uh, the planet uh, is limited, you know, the number of people can, cannot increase and increase and increase infinitely. Uh, and I think it's good to have, uh, you know, new blood, fresh blood, you know, and young people and older people to disappear. This is what I believe. Yeah. It's, it will be a matter of a quality of life in this case. Yeah. But, yeah. Of course. But uh, not about the gen genetics. Uh, is there an area of expertise uh, in which you would like to be more competent for now? Um, in biology, molecular biology, you know, it's really fascinating. And look at the, the, the last uh, chemistry Nobel Prize, you know, CRISPR, you know, uh, yeah. molecular scissors to cut pieces of DNA and uh, paste pieces of DNA. Uh, you know, the yeah. work of Amazing. Charpentier and Doudna. Um, I believe this is fantastic. And I would like to be perhaps uh, yeah, more educated in molecular biology, but you cannot learn everything. So. Of course, but it, yeah. it's interesting. Okay. Um, and science occupies a big part of your life, but uh, what else is important for you? Uh, for me, uh, family life is important. I have always been uh, very cautious, you know, to have a rich family life with my wife, with our son, uh, with our grandsons now. And um, in terms of culture, I love music. So I'm a music uh, consumer, uh, various types of music, you know, from uh, blues and rock to uh, classical music, uh, Baroque music, but even modern uh, classical music. That's great. Mostly. I understand. Okay, thank you for sharing this. It's yeah. interesting very much. I also want to ask you about the system of scientific publications. How comfortable uh, is it for you at the moment uh, taking also into account that you have uh, lots of publications and uh, high citation ratings? Um, yeah, you mean the, the policy, generally speaking, the policy for the, policy, public the publication to... process, uh, some probably, yeah. you know, ethical measures yeah. in, in this process? <laughs> How is it comfortable? I think things have changed. Things have changed dramatically since the beginning of my career. Okay. Because when I was young, you know, uh, let's say when I was a PhD student, um, at the beginning of the 70s, uh, you could read the literature. You know, you could read uh, the chemical literature because there were not two million pages published every day. You, know, you could read the, the 30 journals, you know. Uh, and so this is, I think today it's a big problem because the people cannot read anymore. It's my case also. You cannot read the literature anymore. You can read just bits and pieces, you know, uh, of the literature. Yeah, it's even uh, time consuming to filtrate this kind of information. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's a big problem. And uh, in terms of ethics, um, you know, we didn't count our publications in the same way as today, you know. 
a good group of people was publishing 10 papers a year or so, you know, and everybody was happy. And nowadays, if you are a group of 15 people, you know, you have to publish at least twice or three times as much. And so it forces you to publish and publish and publish, knowing that very few people will read in detail what you are publishing. And this is a big problem. You, know, you do not really believe in what you publish. Yeah, I really understand you and agree with you. Yeah. Uh, okay. And um, I'm very curious about young scientists and their scientific career. How great, how do you think, how great is the influence of scientific leader, a mentor uh, for some person in order to be as much as possible successful in the scientific career? Or you think probably it depends personally for the individual himself? Yeah. Um, well, first I should say that it depends very much on the country also. Mm -hmm. In some countries, you know, the Uh, the young people are pushed, you know, they are really helped. And uh, maybe you will be surprised, but I think this is the case in China. China is a country I know quite well, you know, I, I used to visit, you know, uh, universities frequently. Mm -hmm. And you see many young people who are incredibly enthusiastic, you know, and motivated. And they are very much supported by the system, by the Chinese system. Uh, the selection mode is very strict. You know, it is very difficult to be successful. Uh, but once you have been identified as a promising young scientist, you will be helped. In other countries, it is different. It is the same, more or less, in uh, uh, certain countries in Europe. It is the same in the U.S. But in some other countries, young people are not so well treated. And this is something I deeply regret. Young people should be pushed, you know, because they are the future and they should be given um, all, the, all the, the facilities they, they need to do their research, but especially the good ones. And the mentor, of course, the mentor has an influence because young people, they need some models. You know, they have to think of some people, try to identify them to these models. And so it's important, of course, to have some uh, heroes, you know, to know some heroes. And uh, you would like to, uh, to be similar to, you know, that's important. All right. Yeah, I agree with you. Thanks. And also, Jean-Pierre, uh, we have one secret uh, together with you, but I'm sorry, I need to disclose it. Uh, the fact is that we rescheduled this uh, talk with you for today. Now it's uh, Wednesday, 21st of October, and it's your birthday. Yes, you're right. So, So happy birthday to you and on behalf uh, of all big time team and uh, our scientific community, I wish you bliss, prosperity, calmness, hope, um, love, and as well as great success in every single effort. And also, and also in this regard, I want to ask you, what would you like to, to wish to yourself for the next year of your life? <laughs> well, I would like to wish to myself to still uh, be in good shape and to still be intellectually um, reasonably good, you know. I would like uh, to be intellectually fast and be able to understand rapidly what I read, what I'm uh, uh, discussing with the others. Uh, this is very important. All right. Alex, thank you for your good wishes and th thank you for, uh, you know, uh, wishing me a happy birthday. Yeah, thank you so much. It's a great event and great opportunity. I actually feel myself like I, I have been invited to your birthday, just like we talked today. 
So thank you so much, and you, Jean-Pierre Savage, wishing you all Thanks. the best. Yeah. Thank you. And have a great day today. Yeah, you too. Thank you, Alex. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.